Welcome to Batchadamia, a podcast so educational it could be a university class. With your hosts, Daniel Dick McHugh, Kim Hanna, and Bill Henniger. Welcome, everybody, to Batchadamia. We are in the second to last episode, first to last episode. I never know how we rank those, but we have just done the Men Tell All. We've watched it. Danielle and I are here and we are going to step you through what we care about and probably ignore the rest. Uh, Absolutely. Yep. Basically, we're going to talk a lot about Braden, some about Xavier, uh, a little bit about the Golden Bachelor, um, and then maybe what else we care about. But there, I felt like it was a very like bland men tell all, uh, which is kind of what the season's been, right? You know, I think that the season, well, the season started out really interesting and I was like "Ooh, this feels like the best season Mm -hmm. of like the bachelorette the bachelor that we've had in a while and then it just plateaued yeah I feel like she is one of the best like primaries they've ever had at like really doing this in good faith and interacting with the people and communicating what she wants and I think in that way she is one of like the worst because she's just absolutely crushed any drama that's happened. Like she has been able to just be like, nope, like we're not going down that road. Here's what we're going to do. And it's like, from my standpoint, it's been really interesting, but I think, I wonder if for like the casual viewer, if it's been like, you know. Yeah, it's been a little meh. I mean, I do, I appreciate her. And so like, I find her interesting to watch, but yeah, I think that, Part of it is the only drama has really been around Brayden and that like you almost need more than just one drama point to keep you interested in it. Well, and we'll talk about him, but even Xavier could have been drama, but she just kind of was like, well, I'm done. You know, like when he kind of mealed around, like lots of other bachelor and bachelorettes were like, I'll keep you. And then they sleep together. And then, you know, and she was just like, nah been nice knowing you thanks for the memories so yeah so it turns out that having a really healthy and clear communicator as the lead doesn't make for as great of television i agree (laughs) but before we get started we have the question of the day uh we are almost back to school so danielle and i you all weren't privy to the 20 minute uh, session of airing all our grievances that danielle and i had before this um but next week we start i was on a fishing trip with my high school friend or my college friends this weekend they're all like teachers they all work in a school district they had to start on monday when we came back so everyone's going back to school what is or was your favorite thing about going back to school as a kid kid, definitely i love the back to school shopping all the school supplies i still think like office office supplies is one of my favorite things about going back to school i get excited about you know, maybe I'll buy myself last year, I got a new briefcase and, you know, a new bag, you know, I actually haven't gotten anything. I, maybe that's what I need. I need something shiny to get me excited. Yeah. Um, I will say, you know, since I've been teaching, definitely see getting to see students that I have connections with that I haven't seen over the summer is definitely one of my favorite things about going back. Yeah. I was a big backpack kid. Like yeah. I, I love backpacks. Danielle saw a picture. I got two new fish for my office. I like <laughs> today I had had enough at one point and I went to the local pet store and bought an aquarium and rocks and fish and things to stick in the aquarium. And it made me very happy when I was sitting in my office. Um, the the lady at the pet store informed me that the fish will likely only live like a week. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to make it a good week for him. So um, best, best week of that fish's life. Yeah, they are going to get overfed for sure, much like I do to myself. Um, I think as as like a college professor, uh, definitely in the fall, like it's hard to describe to people who aren't on campus a lot, but there's like an energy that happens the first week and it's really fun, you know. Ooh, and were you out on campus today? I, I was and they had the, the student uh, organization and it's like they, they were all lined up all kind of down the main part of our campus and like students are going in, they're talking to them people are excited yeah music was blaring I love that I love that energy and I will say so our campus um we have a few less students than we used to and 
you know, you can kind of feel that. And I, I do like the energy, you know, I like when you drive around and everybody's moving in and there's yep. like mattresses everywhere. Yep. <laughs> you know? yeah, I was telling I like Dan- the chaos of it. I was telling Danielle, I helped my niece move in. She's coming to our university, which is really exciting. Um, and uh, just seeing all the parents and and it's fun being a professor because I know where stuff is. So like you see them with their map and you get to walk over. Like, you know where you're going? And they're like, yeah. And they take a couple steps and they're like, well, actually, we're just looking for this building. It's like, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> so yeah, it's yeah. exciting. It makes it me It is happy. exciting. I like that. I like that sort of fresh start energy. I like, you know, people, people are still just excited too. You know, they aren't bogged down. Like by the time you get to October, everybody's like, <gasps> Oh. Oh, I need a break. This is hard. Why am well, I and the first this? day of class in January is very different than the first day of class in uh, in August. It's like everyone's just pale. You know, if you didn't know we're in Iowa, it's negative 100 degrees and we're all just like, just get through it. Just get through it, guys. You know, so. Yeah. But then I the mean, end I of was... the, the end of the semester in the spring, it's like magical. Iowa has lovely springs people are just like the weather is nice so yeah yeah it's I I like spring semesters better in part because I do think that you're in the rhythm of things and it doesn't feel like quite a shock to the system the way that diving into the fall does yeah but yes there's definitely a different energy when things start in August then when things start in January and I do I like the energy and and I draw on it and soak it up and yeah all right you ready we'll do it all right here we go we're gonna recap this ish uh there's not a lot to recap actually there's just a few parts uh men tell all everybody doesn't like brayden (laughs) they have several concerns about brayden mainly that he seems very self-absorbed which i would not disagree with um they confront brayden and we're going to talk a lot about brayden so i don't want to belabor him um and then they just kind of uh go on to the next thing uh where they talk about the hashtag fp which i didn't even know this was a thing but they were all putting on their profiles uh fp which is uh fuck peter um so a riff on the let's go joe biden um or let's go brandon you know thing clever as that one was um and then we couldn't really figure out why they didn't like i could you figure out why they didn't like him well, you know, my initial response is, uh, who, who is, who is Peter? Right. And so I think that this was, it feels like this was an inside joke that created drama outside of the show. And then the drama made its way into yeah. the show. It seemed very like junior high where like a group of guys decides they don't like a guy and they're going to like do this kind of inside little joke where they make fun of him. And I, I don't get it. But anyway, so then one guy apologized. He said it wasn't good. Um, yeah, I don't know. It was weird. Yeah, it's like Xavier, I think, apologized. And like everybody else is like, mm. yep. They put Braden in the hot seat. Um, people still don't like him. He gives Jesse Palmer earrings. Um, Xavier comes up. Uh, he basically says he did not do a real good job on that final date we know um he tries to explain himself then charity comes he continues to try to explain himself doesn't go wonderful uh kudos to charity for not being like oh whatever you know fine that's how things go they do the bloopers uh i was not that impressed with the bloopers um right i don't know maybe you liked them i feel like better bloopers so i feel like the men tell all has Mm -hmm either turned into publicity for something else happening on ABC or it feels like complete filler like oh we don't have anything well here's all of the like all of this footage that we haven't done anything with so I guess we'll fill up some time by showing it or here we're gonna do a recap of the whole season which you remember because and and i love bloopers so i i actually i enjoy watching those but i do hate when they do like when they're like you know xavier let's look back at his journey it's like nah, like no one is showing up to this show this is the first time they've watched it watching the men tell all right like no one is like oh i need this no yeah 
just yeah. um then they brought on some ogs it was trista sutter desiree siegfried and diana pappas um and they basically told charity she was awesome i saw a lot of people not excited about it on social media i felt like it was good in principle but went a little too long um it felt i don't know i felt that there is aspects of it that just felt forced yes there were parts that i felt were really authentic and some good stuff came out of it and then there were parts where it's like yeah, I just couldn't figure out exactly what the point was. Um, basically, like you said, they wanted to make a two hour show and they had 35 minutes of content. Um, then the Golden Bachelor sits down um, and he's very nice and we'll talk about him. And then they did the final teaser. That's your review. Did I miss anything? Uh, I mean, I, I think that hits on all of the points. Like I said, it was... It was not a showstopper. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. Not a showstopper. All right. So let's talk a little bit about some of the stuff that was interesting. Uh, Braden, um, I didn't know what to think about him. Like in some ways he kind of like they were, you know, everyone's like, you are annoying and frustrating. And I think he was kind of like, yeah, no, I'm aware. I'm aware I can be. Um but then it didn't seem like he was going to change. I don't know. I was interested in your thoughts because I feel like you see the best in people. And I just really like to not like people. It's part of my my essence. I think that Brayden would definitely grate on me if uh -huh. I had to like live with him in close quarters for a yeah. long time um, or work alongside him. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that I understand why she was attracted to him and not like physical appearance or whatever. Um, there is like an energy about him or when they went on the date, you know, he was so exuberant, you know, mm -hmm. about things. He's like excite, excited. And it was interesting on, they show the clip from him on Bachelor in Paradise, which seems exactly where we expected that he was headed. Um, you know, I think it's Kat that he like ends up making out with and she describes him as being pretty deep. And I think like this is the thing that's interesting about him is that there is something about him that shows that he's like reflective and has some depth to uh -huh. him. And yet, like at the same time, um, I feel like he he thinks that it's confidence other people perceive it as arrogance. And I think that he is someone who really needs validation from other people. Yeah, I'd agree. And so, and that's just a lot. And so, and that he's, you know, kind of plays this, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but he plays this like, oh, I'm so authentic. I'm just me. Kind of like, oh, you aren't going to change me kind of yeah. vibe. Mm -hmm. While at the same time, you know, people are like, hey, you did this. And he's like, no, I didn't. And we're like, but like we saw video evidence of you doing this. And all of these other people say that you did this too. So it's not like they just like manipulated the clips. Right. And it's almost like he takes ownership of stuff, but he really doesn't take ownership of stuff. It's sort of like, he's like, oh yeah, like I did that. But like you said, like he doesn't do anything with that knowledge to like grow and change as a human. And so it feels very empty. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with you. I, I think you probably have described him the best out of anyone I've talked to is that he really needs validation. He thinks he's very authentic. Everybody else thinks it's just like cockiness and it can probably be all three i guess in mm -hmm. some ways um but i just think about like when they did the uh the hunting the sasquatch thing and he was doing something i remember he was asking the camera like should i do this should i do this should i do this and it was like very clear that it was like the you know the high school guy that like asking his friends like should i should i it's like oh he's crazy he's gonna do it um yeah i got really frustrated with the production for constantly going back to him yeah you know like 
I mean, they give him the hot seat. He gets all this attention and all yeah. this conversation around him. And then the rest of the show, they kept showing shots of his reaction. And then, you know, the production also, you know, kind of is giving him free publicity, like showing he look at he's going to be on Bachelor in Paradise and like drawing up all of this he must be the center of attention there too. And yeah. I think that what sort of bothers me is that he's someone that clearly desperately needs to be center of attention mm -hmm. and like they're playing into it. Yeah. But then I also recognize there is something about him that is like, has this charisma, but it yeah. also has a giant red flag with it. Yeah. So like, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. He's like a like the Charles Barkley of uh, for anyone out there for all of the guys the millions of guys that listen to our podcast. Um, uh, he's got that like, yeah, I don't know. There's just something about him that people are drawn to, but it's almost like a rage draw. Like like they want to you know it's to complain about him. I don't know. Well, yeah. he has like really. I mean, I will say that he is very expressive. Yes, like his face is very expressive. He does have this really unique style, but like, it's also clear that he does all of this stuff for attention yes. and that gets exhausting. <laughs> yeah. He'd be exhausted to be married to for sure, because you would constantly be at the whim of his, like what he's doing to see if he can get a little bit of attention. So not related. How awkward was Sean getting up on stage? I, <laughs> so I have to kind of laugh at that because, you know, there's just these things where you're like, somebody really didn't learn their lesson. So I actually find there is something about Sean uh -huh. that actually grates at me even more than Brayden. Oh, yeah, I agree. Yeah. So it's sort of like he has some of the same negative qualities that Brayden has but then tries so desperately to come across as the sweet guy that it, I don't know. Yeah. He, there's something about him, but I have to laugh that he did that because not only was that cringy, but like the thing that the guys got so mad at him about mm -hmm. was like him, like walking in and kind of like, so then like he goes um, up and he yeah. takes a seat that wasn't his, which is essentially like what they felt like he had done on that episode and I didn't completely understand the guy the men's response to mm. him in that moment because I was like okay this guy kind of seems like a turd but like their reaction to this yeah. seemed a little over like unnecessary uh -huh. and now I'm like oh <laughs> yeah oh. Elaine's comment when we were watching it was like you know that guy was the president of his frat it's like yes yeah. so that was like a very like strut up like can I take a seat like I just want to tell you and it's like this is clearly not for her right this is for the cameras and I appreciate Jesse being like go take your seat like <laughs> you don't belong up here yeah I really feel like a lot of him you know the nice things that he said to charity mm -hmm. felt like they were done on his behalf not really on her behalf yeah I wanted to be like don't you know they've already filmed Bachelor in Paradise? Like, you're not getting up there, buddy. Also, I mean, he is such a kin. Like, if even if the Barbie movie wasn't, like, hot right now, uh -huh. you, I cannot look at him and not think that he looks plastic. <laughs> yeah, he, he looks like he's had some type of, yeah. He looks like Lar Lord Farquaad from the Shrek. Now I can't. He really does. He really does. I don't, I haven't seen anyone be like, he's really good looking. I, yeah, I don't know. All right. What about Xavier? Xavier. Such he a disappointment. Up, he tried to explain kind of what, again, what he was thinking. Did you feel like you got any closer to like, what, like why he did it in a way that you're like, okay, I can see where he's coming from. Cause at one point he said, um, I was worried that this is when he's talking to charity. I was worried that you were going to send me home. And so I just needed to tell you how I felt. But it wasn't like I wanted to explain to you why we'd be a good match. It's like he was almost like I just need to get you needed to get it off my chest. See, I feel like he wasn't ready for where the show was going. 
Yeah. And yes, it is a good idea to talk about previous relationships with someone before you get engaged. Like infidelity aside, <laughs> talking about previous relationships and how you handled them and like what you learned from them is probably a good idea before an engagement. But I felt that I felt that he was never quite in it. Mm. You know, like I felt like he was always like, ooh, is is an engagement a thing that I could do in this amount of time? You know, I think that he liked charity, but like maybe wanted to date her. Yeah. But I don't think he was that as serious about her. So like I sort of felt like it was his way out. Like I thought that he kind of knew exactly what he was doing and yeah. that he wasn't really ready to move on on the show and this was going to ensure that he wouldn't um I did appreciate that he seemed to recognize the way that he went about telling her was yeah. probably not appropriate and I think that he understood that but like why he did it never really was well justified I um yeah I don't know. I, I agree with you. I felt like he wanted a way out. I felt like Charity didn't cave as quickly as he would have hoped. And so that's why there was this like, I'm sure, because what it was probably like 10 minutes worth of conversation on the show, which means it was probably like two and a half hours worth of conversation real time. And it's like, you could tell by the end, Charity was really frustrated because she was like, I don't know what he wants. He keeps saying he needs to see more of me this is me. I am who I am. I have not like, um, and it's like, I just felt like he was like, you need to say no, you need to tell me to go home. And it's like, he just kept escalating. And he's like, I'm pretty sure I could not cheat on you when we're married. But also, I'm not sure at all. That was like, oh, gosh, like, yeah. and, and I mean, I think that that was sort of the audaciousness of that interaction was yeah. that it was like, him revealing that he that he had cheated before and that he's not even confident that he could move forward not cheating because like gosh it's just so hard yeah. to not cheat and then his response is well like I just need to have this time with you to see like I need to see more of you. And like, I'm like, no, no, no. Like you can't just disclose all that stuff and then demand anything from her. Yeah, be like, <laughs> That's the audaciousness of this. I'm not totally confident I won't cheat on you. We should probably go have sex so I can make sure, for sure, for sure, probably. I don't know. So y'all, I've got to say, as somebody that's like, how long have I been married? Like 18 years or something. Like there are a lot of things that are hard about marriage. But like not cheating on my partner hasn't been the hard thing. Like, you know, like, yeah. you know, like if I get them, maybe for some people that is the hard thing. And like, I want to empathize with that. But right. like, I just am sort of like, if you think that that's going to be the hard thing in your relationship, mm, there's just like more coming folks, you right. know, like, buckle up. Well, I just, and, and research would back this up. People who cheat, they they put the flag out there that they're open to the idea, right? I highly doubt that there is a situation where someone's like, no, I am married. And somebody pursues you to the point where you're like, you know, where you're like, I they back me into a corner and they made me have sex with them because that's rape. And so it wouldn't be cheating at that point, right? And so I guess just like when somebody's like, I don't know if I can, it's like, so basically what you're saying is you're going to allow the, you know, you're going to allow it to continue to go and hope that at some point you draw a line. And it just, yeah. yeah that's like not how commitment really with anything works. Like yeah. not just like marriage, right? Like if you're yeah. going on a diet and you're like, yeah. mm, I just don't know if I cannot have the ice cream tonight. Then like you're having the ice cream. Exactly. You know, like <laughs> Yeah, that is it. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Any or or if you are like, I'm gonna not drink, and then you're like, but I'm gonna go with my friends to the bar and order a drink. I'm gonna sit in front of me, but you know, like I probably won't drink it. 
I'm likely not going to, I think I won't drink it, right? Like you, you're probably going to drink it. Same thing. Well, it's like as an adult, when you ask somebody to do something and they're like, oh, you know, I'm going to see if I can make that work. That means no, exactly. no, they're not. They're telling you no. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know? yeah I just, yeah, I, I, and then I, I thought it was interesting when he was like, I wasn't trying just to have sex with her. And it's like, that never actually crossed my mind. But after he said it, I was like, I feel like the end of that conversation where he's like, I need more. I think he was basically saying like, we're done, but I will have sex if that's on the table. Like if See, that I is- I think a lot of people interpreted that interaction that way. Okay. And I think Charity did some too. We and innocent I- Bill was like, he'd never do that. See, I didn't. <laughs> Both of us were just like over here, man, you know, yeah. mm. wholesome, like we uh, are. <laughs> Golden Bachelor. What are your thoughts? First thoughts on the Golden Bachelor. I, okay. So I adore him so yeah. far. I find him very charming. I'm really fascinated to see what the season brings. Um, Ryan and I were watching <laughs> the segment together. And like, what? Ryan was like really bummed because like the Golden Bachelor is like, Ryan's really into pickleball right now. And like, so is the Golden Bachelor. And I think he he was just a little sad that his hobby is the same as a seven year seventy year old man's hobby. But one of the things that we discussed is we were a little uncomfortable with the way that the show was covering like his grief and mm-hmm. the loss of his wife. That like I felt like it was like very genuine, authentic, and I wow. do think that's one of the things that we'll probably see more in in this season is people that have had like pretty Mm -hmm. big life experiences they've lived and have been through things. And I think that that's going to affect the dynamic of the show. Yeah. But uh, we also felt like a little like uneasy with the way that his grief was kind of put on display for our entertainment. Yeah. I was hoping I, I, I I went into it and watched it thinking like, well, certainly he's agreed to this. They've checked yeah. out what he said, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, I feel like there probably should have been a disclaimer that was like, you know, we've talked to him or, you know, he's going to talk about this. And uh, cause I feel like if you've had that, it's, it's your right to talk about it and bring it up and, you know, yes. use it as kind of, but you're right. If he was saying it and then they're like spotlighting it and they're like, and you're going to watch this man who's been horribly broken now try to find it. I feel like it seems a little, it cheapens his grief, what the process he had to go through. Yeah. And I mean, I think I appreciate that they were addressing his grief and like telling his story. Mm -hmm. I just think that it was also, it felt like it was, hmm, I don't know. It's just like how the emotion of it was, it felt like it was treated as like, a teaser to draw us into watching it as opposed to there being a real maybe care concern for him for like his life you know like his lived experiences so I don't know so we were talking about that but I found him delightful I thought that he had a wonderful sense of humor I think that you know, he made funny jokes. Yeah. Um, you know, his question, you know, how he answered the question about the fantasy suites was, you know, like it was just charming and exciting. And I do think that there is some potential for this season to really um break the break the script for what this show has been. Yeah, I think the show's gotten stale. Um uh, mm-hmm. and they need something. And I I feel like it's a good vehicle to talk about things that people aren't comfortable talking about. And so uh, Elaine was losing her mind. So for the people who don't know, Elaine's my wife, you know that. Uh, but she's also one of the foremost experts in the country on older adults, Alzheimer's. And so she's excited about this season, but they seem to keep making jokes like about the fantasy suite. Like, like oh, old people having sex, ha ha ha. And it's like, yeah, they sure do. Like... Um, you know, old people doing this. Are you going to do this? It's like, yeah, why wouldn't they? Like, you know, um, and so I hope that this moves the the conversation, you know, to older adults do lots and lots and lots of stuff. Um, yes. Like 
the rest of us. And if you're lucky, someday you're going to be an older adult. And if you're not lucky, you'd be dead. And so, you know, people who like find old people gross or feel like old people are like, they just don't want to engage with it. It's like, you're, you're either going to engage with it or you're going to be dead. So, you know, um, so I hope it opens that up. Or well, like you want them to break the stereotypes, but you don't want the only time to break they break the stereotypes to be in service of a joke. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And also, you know, there are there's things that come with getting older that are just the facts of life, right? Like you're not going to move as well as you do. Um, you're going to need more help with some things, but that doesn't mean you can live a full life. And so I I hope they portray that and not yeah. like this is an old man that never actually got old. And that's what we need to, you know, all aspire to. Not all of us are going to have that, but this is an older person that has some things that they can't do, but they still have a very full life. Um, yeah. And if that doesn't happen, I'm going to listen to a full season of Elaine, just like rage commenting the whole show, because every time they'd make a joke, she'd be like, ha ha ha. Oh, old people. Ha 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 ha. Um, so. I can't yeah. wait. I, I We think we need to invite her onto an episode. Oh um, yeah. Because maybe multiple because I think she's gonna have some really awesome insights onto things and um so I have to say um many people aren't going to know who this is but he looks the golden bachelor Gary looks so much like Michael Hyatt who is the owner of full focus planners like he's kind of in personal development he's kind of a big name nobody looks so <laughs> similar they look so similar so if you are like a planning or personal development geek like i don't know just like google michael hyatt and you'll be like oh is he the golden bachelor no that's not gary gary's the golden bachelor i like that you're like some people might not know i some people <laughs> again i feel like if you do like the venn diagram with all of the success of your planning podcast I feel like we have enough overlap that maybe we, a fair amount of our listeners know what he looks like. I thought actually, I thought of the idea today that it would be really fun for us to do like a crossover episode that could be something like um, a crossover episode that's like 10, um, sorry, like 10 things I learned about planning and goal setting from watching The Bachelor. Oh, I like it. I like it. We might have to, I see some collabs in the yeah, future. Right. All right. What's your dish? What's my dish? Oh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about authenticity. And I think this comes up a lot, you know, like in a lot of these shows because it's reality TV, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I began to think about is how often the villain's defense is that they're too real for reality TV. So like I wrote the question, like are villains just too real for reality TV? And, you know, that's kind of Braden's defense too. And I think you could go back and I'd be shocked. Uh, I want Bachelor Data, where are you? If you're listening to this uh. podcast, Bachelor Data, I want to know how many of the villains use the argument that they're just too real. They're too authentic. And like the reason that people don't like them is because they're being authentic and everybody else is putting on a show. So anyway, I just, I just think that that's interesting. Yeah, I guess the question is, so really basically what they're saying is I'm being me and if everybody else were themselves on the show, they would be just as disagreeable as me. <laughs> I guess I feel like that's the like if you really break the argument down that's what they're saying I just don't know well and I think that you know with Brayden and you've heard this other times on the show part of it too is their unwillingness to participate in right the way that the show works right yeah. so they're like hey I'm worried about an engagement or I don't know how I feel about her dating 20 other guys. And everybody's like outraged, but like in real life, if you're like, yeah, I don't want my partner dating 20 other guys, you'd be like, uh-huh. Yeah. Um, you and all your girlfriends at a bar being like, take your time, take your time. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> yes. So I think that, but you know, one of our, you know, like a really important communication skill, for example, 
is to understand, I'll use the language of like, you know, performance, is to understand the scene that you're in <laughs> and right. to adapt your communication to the situation. And yeah. so what's really interesting is when we do talk about people being fake, for example, it's because we oftentimes expect uh, people's performance of identity to have some consistency to it. And when they haven't, we start to we start to suspect mm -hmm. whether we get suspicious. That's when they're sus, as my my seven year old would say, "Mom, you're sus, right? Like you're suspicious, right? That like people that are being sus are mm -hmm. people that in some ways are not as consistent in their performance of identity. And so there's like this interesting thing though that like he's saying that he's authentic because he hasn't adapted mm -hmm. but they're saying he's not yeah yeah you just broke off there did you get oh, did i yeah sorry no, not broke off you just like it's like you got like an even better thought i've been oh. around you enough you seem like you were processing a whole nother thought there Maybe, maybe I think I ran out of thoughts. Actually, I think That's fine. I was like that was all the words I had. They're just out <laughs> now. <laughs> I agree. I I think it's an interesting defense by the villains. Um, I also think some of it comes around that idea of like the unwritten rules that no of us know, none of us know, or have have never been like said out loud. But they're like. When someone's in a one-on-one, -on -one, you don't just come up and break in when you've already had one. And it's like, well, that would be the nice thing to do. But it's not like, I don't think it's a rule because they allow it to happen. And so it's like, and they're like, I'm here to find my wife. Like, I'm not here to be your friend. And there's just a part of me that's like, well, I can't fault them for that. And so in that way, they're being authentically themselves. But yeah, I don't know. And then I always think like, would you want... I wouldn't want to be married to somebody who breaks like social nice, you know, like I would want someone who's kind to be married to. I wouldn't. Yeah. Well, like he just really does. I mean, to kind of to go back to our conversation earlier, there's something where he simultaneously feels like he under, like he has some depth to him and that he understand and it is aware of things. Mm -hmm. But then at, on the other hand, you know, the guys were really upset with him for coming back to apologize yeah and he's he's sort of like because he wasn't there to get back on the show yeah at least that's what he says so I'm, i couldn't tell like is that him just like protecting his ego i think so because yeah. i think if she would have said yeah you can come back he would have because he never at any point was like i have no intention of coming back on the show right he kind of did this like awkward kind of apology but he never like set that boundary right away well and i think the guys are sort of like well look at this from our perspective like we're trying to further our relationship with her and you took time yeah that we could have had otherwise and you're admitting that you never actually desired to further your relationship with her hmm. and it's sort of like he lacked the capacity to yeah empathize but it's also like or was it that he just you know he didn't think of that and he was trying to protect his ego by not looking like he got rejected again right i don't know he's a complex cat he's also a 23 year old and I was a real ass at 23 too. So that's what I keep thinking. Like I, oh my gosh, sometimes I got married at 23 and I like, I felt like I understood the world y'all. Yeah. Like people are like, whoa, you're getting married. I was like, yeah, I got this. I got this. And you know, we did okay. Right. <laughs> so like I like look back on that. I was like, Ooh. <laughs> yeah. 23 year old Bill would not have been a good choice to get married to at all <laughs> all right uh predictions for the end of the season um so it's Dotton and uh well i think maybe aaron too and then the the dude who like loves her who apparently doesn't have a personality oh yeah um why can't i think of his name they make out a lot Yo, we... Joey. yes Joey. 
I mean, whew, I don't know. I would I would guess done. Mm-hmm. Really? Mm-hmm. I'm I I think I, that that's yeah. who she should choose. I don't know that I think that's who she will choose. I think she's gonna choose Joey and then he's just gonna melt down. I don't think she ends up. I'm wondering if she doesn't end up with anybody. I know we say this every like huh, this that's only happened a few times. Uh, but I'm gonna go with the the shoot the moon prediction that she ends up with nobody. Okay. And Joey, she tries to pick Joey and he just melts down. Cool. Are we I watching like he, together? Huh? Yeah. Are we watching together? I think Kim and you are coming over. You bet. Yeah. All right. You ready for the city shout out? Give it. A little bit different one today because I was like, ooh, let's do Brooklyn. And I was like, well, is it Brooklyn, Iowa, what everyone knows, or that little town Brooklyn in New York, which nobody knows of. And no, so I was no. like, well, it can be both. So Brooklyn, Iowa and Brooklyn, New York, uh, thanks for listening. I've got some facts about you. Um, what's the total land mass of Brooklyn, Iowa? 1.31 square miles. Brooklyn, New York, a measly 97 square miles. What's the population of Brooklyn, Iowa? 1,502. That tiny little New York City, 2,736,074. Um, Isn't but, that wild to think about that there's more land mass in Brooklyn, Iowa, but there's like two point, like two million more people there? Yes. Yeah, the, the people per square uh, whatever is uh, quite a bit um quite a bit bigger uh they don't really have anything like what's the major driver in brooklyn iowa um they don't have that um but brooklyn new york obviously has lots of stuff um they have wonderful lots of different people from cultures um all over the world it's almost predominantly white in brooklyn iowa uh specifically 99.2 percent um famous people notable people from brooklyn new york just a few. They didn't have a lot. Jay-Z, Mos Def, Aaliyah, Eddie Murphy, Marissa Tomei, Larry King, the notorious B.I.G., Jimmy Kimmel, Larry David, Joan That's Rivers, uh, Gilbert Gottfried, Jerry Stiller, and Leah Remini. From Brooklyn, Iowa, Bruce Braley, Harold Keller, friend, uh, Bernard Meyer, who is a Catholic missionary to China who served as perfect apostle of who's who uh he was born in brooklyn that's all the people i, I find it pretty impressive for a population of 1000 people to have generated such talent yep also like i feel sad that like the diversity like it's like one person that's making the like 0.8 percent <laughs> yeah uh median household income of brooklyn iowa thirty four thousand five hundred thirty eight dollars uh let me see. I don't even know if they have the median income here. I bet the cost of houses would be an interesting comparison. <laughs> yes. They have several giant colleges. Brooklyn, Iowa has an elementary school. <laughs> hey, I'm glad that they kept their elementary school yeah. there. Yeah, I think the, the high school is consolidated, though. Yeah. BGSU, yeah. I think, maybe. So. Cool. That's, that's all I got. That was awesome. Do Check you have, out next time, folks. Do you have any shout outs? Oh, my shout out is just to our amazing listeners. Keep it up. We appreciate you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good week. And we will see you when school starts at the end of the season. It'll be all three of us. Yay. You have been listening to Bachademia. With your hosts, Danielle Dick McGew, Kim Hanna, and Bill Henney. All thoughts and opinions expressed on the show are solely those of the person who spoke them. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to the show, leaving a five star rating and review wherever you listen to your podcast. Also, please share with your family, friends, colleagues, and other ardent Bachelor fans. If you have comments or questions you would like us to address on the show, you can email us at bachadamia at gmail.com or on the Twitter with the handle at Batchadania. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. listening.